Hello, and welcome to the Two Real Cinema Club. I'm James Rizika. And I'm Andres Lorente. And this week on Two Real Cinema Club, we'll be discussing um, two films and trying to make some connections between the two. We usually like to have an older film and a newer film. And this week we go into the world of Los Angeles, uh, 1970s and 1980s Los Angeles. We will be discussing Licorice Pizza, which is streaming now and in theaters now. And uh, then we'll talk about uh, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, a classic from uh, 1984. And we'll see if we can make some connections between these two films. So, did you enjoy Licorice Pizza? Um, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna confess. <laughs> that's that's lukewarm. Not... That's very lukewarm. <laughs> I'm not sure I got this film. To be honest with you, I think uh, uh, I went with my wife and stepdaughter. They liked it. They saw a lot in it. Um, I just didn't. There wasn't a lot of meat for me um, in this film. And you know, honestly, it's kind of the same way with. Um, the older film, too, Fast Times at Ridgemont High. I've well, seen that film probably four or five times. The same sort of thing. So I'm going to go really, on. It's, yeah. so it's not enough meat on it for you, but you've still seen it five times. So that, like, yes. You, you are vegetarian, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> happy, to, happy to eat without the meat. So what, so it, uh, ex, what, what happens in Licorice Pizza? How, how would you describe it? Um, Licorice Pizza is a very nostalgic look, I think, at uh, 1970s Los Angeles. Um, so it feels very L.A., um, because it is uh, very L.A. Um, I guess it's a romance, um, and I'm not... There are some, certainly some comic moments, but I, I didn't find it like a, a full-on comedy. Um, and it is a teen picture of sorts, I think, but made by someone who was a teenage or a teenager in those years, um, Paul Thomas Anderson. Uh, talks about uh, the industry a little bit and that Gary is one of the protagonists. He's a child actor who... It's and he's a school aged guy now. I think he's fifteen or so, so he should be in yeah, high school. 15. Um and it's funny because he doesn't do either in the film. He does very little child acting and he does almost no schooling as far as I can tell. So <laughs> that was a conundrum for me. He meets Alana, who is sort of a restless young woman in her mid twenties. I think she's about twenty five, but it's a 20, little twenty six, I think she 26. tells him in the beginning. Six. Yeah. Okay. He's fifteen. So there's a ten or eleven year age difference between these two, and she's uh Still living with her family and sort of awkwardly graduating into adulthood. They meet in one of the longer meet cutes you'll ever see in cinema, where Gary's getting ready for his uh, school fic pictures on photo day, and she's working for the company that takes the pictures. And they, they strike up a chemistry in his long uh, wait and long walk towards the camera. Um, they become friends. And despite the age difference, um, there is some sort of romance or some sort of spark there. But Alana falls for um, one of Gary's uh, co-stars in some sort of television show or movie that they had done together. Um, so there's this on and off, uh, a somewhat nebulous uh, situation of, are they a couple? Aren't they a couple? Are they lovers? Are they friends? Um, so I think, you know, and, and without really a clear antagonist other than one another, it seems like that's the tension. Is this a love or is this a friendship? Yeah. I don't know if you got that as well, but that, I mean, I couldn't point to anyone else as being sort of their, their enemy or their antagonist. They're, they're separate moments and random, um, I, I think sequences. they are their own worst enemies, aren't yeah. they? The two of them actually. I, I, tell you, I, I made a little note here. I wrote in the, in the margin, the wonderful adversarial, mercurial, passionate relationship is what I described it yeah. as. Because I think that's, that's like, that is the whole of the film, isn't it? It's them kind of um, clashing together, um, like, like two jigsaw pieces that kind of don't quite fit, and, and they just brute force their way together at the end, I think. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of running. There's a lot of running to each other. There is, there is a lot of running, isn't there? There is a lot of running. It's not the exercise <laughs> variety either. It's uh, <laughs> 1970s before we did that for exercise. Um, so uh, Gary is in high school, as we said, but uh, he never really attends because he's too busy, I don't know, starting different businesses and things like that. His parents do some sort of marketing or, or promotion, and he seems to have a real entrepreneurial spirit um, so that his opening up a waterbed uh, store and then eventually was a, there anything more seventies than a waterbed <laughs> store? That's that's the seventies. Even they're, they're waterbeds with ashtrays in. That is the whole of the nineteen seventies yeah, yes. compressed into one piece of furniture, isn't it? Yes, uh, very. Yes, again, the, everything about this film screams the nineteen seventies. There's also a pinball arcade that he opens up later in the film, 
um, uh, when pinball becomes legal again, which I was surprised that pinball was ever illegal in California, yeah. but apparently yeah. it was. And um, so that's sort of the the first act of this film is them meeting, and then she sort of joins him in some of his businesses, um, uh, certainly in the, in the waterbed sales. Um, and she also had accompanied him on this trip to New York City, where he actually, um, where she actually um, uh, sort of starts a romance or gets some interest in one of his um, uh, colleagues on that uh, program that they were in as children. Um, so Gary, again, is not really doing much acting, but he is uh, very much uh, entrepreneurial at this point. Um, and then the, the story is really more or less just will they fall in love or, or won't they? It's almost like boy meets girl, um, boy gets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl. It's all that uh, again and again and again. So we're just never really <laughs> sure where we stand for them. Um, Alana is um, eventually, um, <clears throat> excuse me, eventually he gets her into acting, but ever so briefly. Um, I'd say, like, towards the end of the first act, there's this moment where Gary gets arrested and she runs, uh, falsely arrested, is under some trumped up circumstances. He gets arrested, the police take him to a station. Alana runs, this is one of the big runs, is when she runs <laughs> to the police station to support him. So there's definitely a lot of. Um, fondness there they definitely care about each other but they're not always very nice to each other um shortly after that he gets her into acting but she doesn't pursue it for very long in fact i think her um her, the midpoint of the film is sort of when sean penn who's playing a sort of a famous actor is he's somehow managed to get her cast in a film as his opposite it seems like they're going to date a little bit um, Gary starts to get quite jealous uh, for one reason or another. Tom Waits encourages Sean Penn to jump <laughs> over a fire on his <laughs> motorcycle outside of a restaurant. Alana sort of is on the back of the bike but falls off the back of the bike. And that gives Gary a chance to run after Alana to show his support for her. So they are um, uh, runs that are, um, I don't know, complimented. They both run for one another once in a while. But they don't seem to, at that point, they were not getting along. Um, but they are doing mutual runs to rescue one another. Um, and then all of a sudden, her, her at the midpoint of the film, it's like she doesn't have a job, he doesn't have a business. Um, her, her acting career just sort of ends at that moment. And then also the oil embargo, very topical, gets yeah. thrown in there as a big threat to the waterbed industry because waterbeds are, of course, made of petroleum products. So I've got you at about the midpoint, even the end of that second act in my mind. Is it, has anything come up for you yet? Just hearing the, well, the recap. Tell, right? I mean, you're, you're exactly right. That it, it does feel like the film is about kind of explicitly about two people running towards each other. Um, yeah. Uh, but kind of, yeah, but missing every time it's um, I, I think um, some of those early scenes between them, kind of the scenes where Gary is jealous of Alana. Alana is jealous of Gary um, there's this wonderful scene where there's a silent phone call. You know, Gary knows that Alana's gone out with his friend Lance. Um, and so he phones up and pretends to be Lance, but he doesn't say anything on the phone. And she kind of quickly figures out that it probably is Gary. So she phones him back, but he doesn't say anything to her and she kind of doesn't say anything to him. And those kinds of silent phone calls that that's, that's, you know, a really familiar scene from anybody's adolescence, isn't it? There's kind of jealous, silent, seething emotional phone calls where nobody says anything. I thought those, those are some really well observed scenes, actually. Um, and in the same way that when they're, you know, they're not an item, but they're kind of flirting a bit. And there's another lovely scene where um, they're both sitting at a table. They're kind of adding up takings from the water bear business. And above the table, everything is kind of quite sensible and businesslike. And the camera just dips below the table you know, and, and he rests his leg just against the side of her knee. And it's, you know, it's really gentle little touch, but it's a you know, beautifully observed little moment about this kind of this on off relationship that they have that, you know, you know, maybe, maybe he, you know, she, he wants it, but she doesn't want to say yes, but then maybe she wants it as well. And she doesn't want to say no. And, you know, they, they kind of, you know, orbit around each other. Um, I think it's really beautifully observed. Um, what happens in the second half? Yeah. I would say that well done on your part. I think you do have to look for some of those moments to really see the, the nice storytelling touches and the, and the beautiful observations uh, in the film itself. Um, what happens the second, uh, the third act is um, 
Well, politics, of course. We've talked about uh, yeah. business and sort of Hollywood. You've got to get politics in there. All of a sudden, Alana joins a mayoral um, political campaign, um, ostensibly because she likes one of the guys who's working on the plane. I think she gets the thing going by calling this one gentleman who works on a, a, a political campaign. Um, turns out that the Gary gets some insider knowledge on this um, idea that the pinball is going to be made uh, legal again. So... Uh, Gary, 16-year-old mastermind, um, manages to, I guess he already has a space that they've been using for the waterbed store. He's just going to turn that into a, uh, an arcade in a matter of a couple weeks, does it. Um, so Gary is pursuing pinball and arcades and Alana gets into, um, politics, seems to be doing pretty well. Um, and there's sort of a late surprise in the sense that the, the character running for mayor, um, is homosexual and he at one point in order to sort of downplay or or hide his sexuality um when he's having dinner with his partner in a restaurant he brings or invites alana on to sort of act as his uh his beard his girlfriend or something so that uh, people taking pictures or following wouldn't notice that um uh, or even wouldn't guess that he's gay. Um, I, I had to look that up, that thing, beard, because I wrote in my notes, oh. oh, you know, she has to act as his beard. Yeah. Oh. And, and after I wrote that, I thought, is that, is that, is that, are we allowed to say that? Is that homophobic or not? Is that all right? I had to look it up on Wikipedia. No, it is all right. It's, I'm still I think hearing it's all right. it. Yeah, yeah. I'm still hearing it. It's a euphemism. It's a, uh, just something that we still say, as far as I know, but check me if uh, that's not true. People can it's, complain. It's a proper taxi driver kind of scene, isn't it? The, 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 the scenes in that mayoral campaign. Really, really reminds me of Taxi Driver, yeah. and I'm sure it's you know it's deliberate. It's not coincidental. Yeah. Um, and then Alana leaves the campaign sort of right on the spot there. I think she felt like she was sort of used a little bit. She It was unclear. And she definitely was very close to having sort of a romantic relationship with her friend in the office, but then she also sort of has a bit of a crush on the, the candidate for mayor, and um, it seems like she's interested in him. So I think she's really let down. That sets her into running. So she's running <laughs> across town because she's missed the opening night of the the arcade. And at one point, I think uh, that means that, uh, of course, Gary is going to start running in the opposite direction. So they're very clearly running from, I think Alana always runs from right to left. And Gary always runs from left to right. Yeah. And they, they do finally run into each other. And, and then knock each other like, over, don't they? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it seems Which... like they're going to sort of be together finally. Um, at the end of the film, um, even though even in that moment, Gary's a little uh, perhaps uh, hasty and sort of announces to the whole crowd <laughs> at the arcade that they're going to be together. And she sort of pushes him and shoves him off. So there's still this <laughs> playfulness. And it is, it's a little odd because she is 25, 26 years old and he is in high school. So um, the arrangement is a little puzzling. And, <laughs> yeah, and it's yes. covered over in dialogue at one point where she asks her sister, I think they're smoking a cigarette, and she says, do you think it's weird that I hang out with Gary and all his friends? Um, so, I mean, if you flip that script and it's a 25-year-old man and a 15-year-old girl, it reads, I think, a little more uh, troublesomely. Um, so that's a that's about it. I mean, let me know if I if you think I've left out anything major. I think I think that's... I think that's that's because I've nailed it. It's um, It's like you say, that's not a very strong through story on this yeah. film is that it's like it's a it's a few slices of life and uh, you know a bunch of memorable scenes which i enjoyed yeah. and without there being a really strong through line and i don't think it's about the through line i think it's about enjoying the two characters i yeah. personally really warmed to them both i don't know whether you like them i mean to start with gary is difficult to alike and he's a bit abrasive and you know, yeah. and, and brash and full of himself but by the end i warmed to him i think because of those silent scenes there's a scene where he's watching Alana with William Holden in the restaurant. And Sean Penn is being, you know, kind of slimy and lizardy. Um, and, you know, and he just watches her silently from across the restaurant. And, yeah, you can you know, see the inner turmoil. It's a lovely scene, actually. I think it's really good. Um, I, I think the person who is the real revelation in the film is Alana Hyam, who um, yeah. this is. So this is her movie debut, isn't it? Um, do you like Hyam, the band? I don't know the group band Hyam. Yeah, so I'm not. I, okay, I, would, yeah, so I feel like, um, or maybe it's like the, the only contemporary band that I could actually name a song by. Um, <laughs> I think I think they're fantastic. Oh, so it's, you know, so, but it's a delight to see that the, um, you know, the members of the band, because so, so the three members of the band are the three sisters in the film. Yes. So, yeah. yeah so I picked Alana's up on sisters, that later, yeah. <laughs> yeah, in the film are the band members. And I didn't realize until the end of the movie, um, her parents in the film are her real parents. That's true too, well. yeah. 
<laughs> so it's I like a proper little two. vision into you know their their home life. And the parents are fantastic. The band are fantastic. Yeah. Um, and there's um, something very natural about Alana Hyam. She's just fantastic. If imagine having to sign up for your debut film and realizing you're you know you're doing a one on one scene with Sean Penn. Yeah. And you know in her scene with Sean Penn. I think you know Sean Penn looks like he's acting and he's acting very well, but Alana Haim just looks like she is there in the moment. Um, I think she's fantastic, um, and the, the whole business about the running—I mean, she runs everywhere, and the way that she expresses her character with her kind of stampy gait, you know, and sprinting here and there—you um, know—that's that's a great character work. I think you know she runs and she looks like she means it. I think she's fantastic. So you know, really, really enjoyed it. It yeah. is a great cast. Um, Cooper Hoffman, who's um, Gary, is um, uh, it's his, his debut film, isn't it? And I think he does a great job. Sean Penn, you know, is Sean Penn. Uh, Bradley Cooper is kind of crazed hairdresser come producer. John Peters does a kind of great comedy turn as a um, bizarre, aggressive and terrifying character. And even, um, you know, Tom Waits you know, is watchable in everything. Yeah. Um, so uh, great cast. Great character work. There isn't much of a story, and I find that I don't care. I think that's probably yeah. I think that's what you've got to look for. You, I, I, I always go in expecting a story, and this is really more about um, the atmosphere. The color is amazing for the nineteen seventies. I mean, it really captures that time. Um, whether it's just nostalgia or if it's because we've seen that look in so many other films, but um, it definitely captures that era very well. Uh, but it, it does feel it felt quite random. Um, in terms of things that happen, like the Bradley Cooper scene is fairly long. I mean, it's a sizable chunk of the film, um, and it involves this uh, waterbed delivery gone uh, foul, and then the escape where um, Alana has to drive a, <laughs> drive a delivery truck backwards through a s- significant portion of Los Angeles. Um, <laughs> and it was, yeah, I don't know if it was, it was, it was it a massive metaphor for her? she's going backwards in life, but she's doing it very well. Um, I don't know, but uh, as if you piece it all together, expecting one yeah through line, I don't think it, it, it holds that way. But it's yeah, that, that that yeah, well, I was just saying it's utterly without consequences, isn't it? Like they you know, they yeah. they smash up John Peters's car and they ruin yeah. his house and they you know they backpedal away at ninety miles an hour going down a hill backwards and yeah, there are no consequences None. whatsoever. No, you, know, you could you could snip those twenty minutes out of the film and and nobody would notice. Yeah, um, and in fact, is that does- strength or a weakness? Yeah, he doesn't, and John Peter doesn't seem to mind either. Where he's immediately flirting with the next women on town when he's, <laughs> when he's looking yes. for a, what gasoline for his car, which has already been destroyed. I don't think he can even <laughs> drive it home at this point. So um, that was a, a big part of the film, and uh, yeah, as you said, I think it could be snipped if necessary. And I think that kind of brings me to the whole something that really struck me for both films, which is this Alfred Hitchcock idea that you know, film is like life with all the boring bits snipped out and i felt like for both of these films a lot of the boring bits were sniffed out snipped out but it still (laughs) didn't get to be that exciting i was never really (laughs) that glued to this film i did see it in the theater which was a nice experience but um it never really uh, gripped me that that strongly i I found myself really enchanted by this film actually i enjoyed it a lot more than i expected to i I went in with relatively low expectations and it really it utterly charmed me um, and I think, you know, a lot of that is to do with Alana Hyam, I think. And you know, there there is a degree of you know, nostalgia, not for a, a world that I experienced, but for a world that I experienced by proxy through watching Hollywood cinema of the, of the 70s and the 80s. Yeah. There's lots of quotes in this film from other pictures. Taxi Driver, we talked about. Yeah. Um, Fast Times at Ridgemount High uh, is also quoted in the film. Um and uh, there are some shots which I'm sure are stolen straight out of Assault on Precinct 13, I think, with the with, mm. with the van um, coming to a halt at dawn. Um, apparently, the film was all shot on 35 mil, uh, which is a rarity in itself these yeah. days, and using old lenses. That's the press release that I read, okay. whatever that means. But um, at least you can understand why it gives it that um, that genuine 70s nostalgic feel, because they're using... You know, the real equipment from that era. It's a little bit like people making 80s sounding records using equipment from the 80s. This is a a, a film about the 70s shot using equipment from the 70s. Yeah. Um, And I tell you what, aren't aren't there a lot of 1970s cars around in Los Angeles? I'm amazed that they managed to get enough vintage 
new looking cars to queue up um, to be in the in the queues for gas at the petrol stations. Yeah. Really, really authentic. Well, I'm sure there are entire businesses that are just uh, used to (laughs) supply 70s cars. Yeah, for film. Is that why? I bet I'll read it. It's all it's all CGI. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) It was all it was all filmed on a green screen in New York. No, I think the amazing thing is no. That's it's going to be quite the opposite, which is the amazing thing for sure. Yeah, but I think it does end up being as a result of all these touches. It sort of definitely becomes a film about films and an LA film about LA. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, that's Licorice Pizza. We'll have a quick break, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about Fast Times at Ridgemount High and see if we can connect the dots. We'll speak to you in a minute. Welcome back to Two Real Cinema Club. So we've talked about Licorice Pizza, and now we are going to talk about the film that we coupled that with, which is Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Take it away, Dr. Jimmy. Well, I so, yeah, it's interesting that you said you'd seen this four or five times, because I had never seen this film before now. Um, and I, I'm not completely sure how I managed to miss it so completely. I think I was sort of vaguely aware of it. I don't know whether it may be it wasn't nearly as popular in the UK as it was in the United States. Mm. I was kind of aware of it, but it, it had managed to pass me by. Um, so, you know, a lot of fun to see it, a lot of fun to see it after Licorice Pizza. Mm. So for people who haven't seen it, Fast Times, Fast Times at Ridgemount High, 1982 film directed by Amy Heckerling, um, who also made Clueless, more famously, Look Who's Talking, which I've never seen, mm. um, A Night at the Roxbury. Um, and it was written by Cameron Crowe. Uh, based on a, his own non-fiction book where he, at the age of 23, I'm not sure who will get away with this now, managed to persuade um, a San Diego high school to let him enroll as a transfer student for a year and pretend to be a teenager so he could spy on the teenagers and write a non-fiction book about their lives. I, I can't imagine that would wash now. Could you imagine somebody getting away with that now? Definitely <laughs> not. But... <laughs> yeah, pervert journalist spied on teenagers. That's what the newspapers would say. Or, or let so, uh, someone like Alana, in her character in the other film, go into a high school as a as a twenty six year old woman. I guess start scoping out the fifteen year olds. Of course, she wasn't so there the, for a year exactly, <laughs> invading their <laughs> private lives. But so, so the story uh, again, it's it's not quite a portmanteau film, but it's a film with you know lots of little chapters. Um, and if there is a main character, it's probably Stacy, who's Jennifer Jason Lee. Um, she's 15 years old. Um, she works at a local pizza place. She is a schoolgirl. Um, and it's kind of the story of her sexual awakening. But when you phrase it like that, it's, it sounds like a soft porn film from the 70s. And it's not quite that. Um, she uh, she wants to learn about love. Um, <laughs> she she hooks up with like a 26-year-old stereo salesman. And interestingly, I'm sure that this this is part of what has um, fueled licorice pizza because at the beginning of Ridgemount High we have you know a, a sex scene between a 15 year old girl and a 26 year old man mm-hmm. um, which are exactly the inverted ages of the characters in licorice pizza yeah. I'm sure it's deliberate mm-hmm. so um, she has a, a fairly gnarly unpleasant cold uncomfortable sex in a dugout with a 26 year old <sighs> Um, and yeah, and that's her kind of initiation into the the adult world. Um, she has a date with uh, you know a rat who's a bit of a kind of an awkward sweet boy. Um, she ends up having sex with Mike at her uh, her pool. She gets pregnant. She has a termination, and she ends the school year kind of you know wiser and a bit more mature. Um, and uh, but still working in the same pizza place and still going to the same school. And yeah, you know, she's kind of evolved a little bit, but not enormously. And then the film is mostly filled out with a whole bunch of subplots um, with other teenagers at the school. So there's her Stacy's brother, Brad, who has a series of stupid jobs, um, which he gradually messes up one after another. Sean Penn appears as a stoner. Um, and uh, there's a long sort of uh, series of stories about him um, appearing in history class and, and messing up. And he's kind of the comic relief. Um, there is Linda. Uh, who is Phoebe Cates, who is uh, Stacy's more experienced uh, friend who kind of gives her advice, although her own boyfriend is entirely invisible. We never see him. 
Um, and, you know, the classes continue throughout. We see a bit of biology and we see a bit of history and we see kind of various dorky kids having, you know, their normal dorky moments. There's, you know, there are a bunch of very memorable scenes. There's um, an awkward date between Stacy and Rat at a restaurant where they're sat in these enormous chairs that make them look like they're each six years old, which is you know, hilarious. And I remember feeling just like that as a teenager, going to grown up restaurants and feeling you know, very self-consciously like a child. Um, there's, you know, as, as the father of a girl who's going to be 15 this year, there mm. is probably the most heart-stoppingly terrifying scene in all of cinema. <laughs> <laughs> and Stacy, at the age of 15, sneaks out of her parents' house to go on a date with a 26-year-old man. Um, so my heart was in my mouth for that. Yeah. Um, Sean Penn uh, gets very stoned and, and crashes a car. Um, so you, know, you come away from this film with a lot of memorable images seared into your brain. But you know, whether they all add up together to form a cohesive whole, I'm not sure. Um, I think the film ends up looking a little bit like... Um, what I suspect Cameron Crowe's book was a whole series of anecdotes that have mm. been pasted in page after page. You know, you turn the page and you get another anecdote. Does it entirely add up to a story? I'm not sure. I'm struggling to think of what the theme would be come the end of the film. And um, the best I can come up with is love is painful or the way to learn is to experiment. When I mean, that's you know fair enough. I'd be interested to know whether the film talks to a modern audience and whether they would get the same uh, the same message. You know, uh, it's noticeable that it's that the film is set in an era when you could make mistakes and they could be forgotten. Whereas, you know, these days, if you make some kind of mistake, then there will be um, pictures of you all over Twitter and Instagram and Facebook making that mistake for for you, your friends, your family and your employer to look at forever. Um, so it kind of harks back to a, you know, a simpler, more innocent time. Um, are we better off now than then? Are we better off then than now? I don't know. I don't know. So you, once you saw it for the fifth time this week, <laughs> did you enjoy it any more now that you're seeing it as an adult? Uh, no, I th I don't think it's aged terribly well um, either um, culturally or uh, cinematically. I don't think it's really done that well. Uh, it's, it's almost 40 years later. Is that right? Whoa! Close yeah, to, is it eighty two or is it eighty four? Forty years this year, I think. Nineteen eighty two is 82. the year that I looked at. I think it's forty okay. years this year. Oh yeah. my god, I feel old now. Yeah. Um, do, how, what do you feel about the sexual politics of the film? How does that look to a modern eye? Doesn't look very good at all. I don't think the women are treated very well. Um, you know, their their journey seems to be mostly sexual. The boys are definitely um, hypersexualized as well. I'm not sure that they actually have much more going for them either. I think the the Mike characters, uh, he's, sell, he's scalping tickets, so he's trying to make money on the side, and and uh, Brad wrestles with one lousy job after another, and the girls wrestle with jobs too. But um, there's nothing. It's not too um, boy fleshed out is really not the right word to use there. <laughs> yeah, it's very fleshed out. In fact, yes, <laughs> it's, there is it's no probably of fleshing out. <laughs> it is like the camera. Out. I, I wrote here that the camera really seems to like to linger on Phoebe Cates and Jennifer Jason Lee. Yeah. Um, and and there, you know, there is male nudity in the film as well, but the camera does not linger on their bodies in the same way that it does on the girls. And there is much um, now. I, I don't know how much of this is a reflection of the values of the time or how much it is um, the concept of um, knowing your audience and whether they felt that, you know, this is uh, you, if you put Phoebe Cates in a, in a bikini on the VHS cassette box yeah. You, know, you know, you're going to sell to a lot of horny teenage boys. Yeah. I did find myself at the end of the movie wondering whether Stacy was a victim or whether she was like a teen icon of self-determination. Mm. Um, I don't think she believes that she is a victim. But I'm not sure whether you look at her now with, with the eyes of 2022, whether you feel that mm. um, she's really as, as in control of herself as she would like to think she is. Yeah, probably a little of both. I think uh, at that age, you probably feel like you're more in control. But uh, with with hindsight, or if if she were more adult, she wouldn't. You wouldn't think of her as having much control at all. So I think uh, it's a little of both. Um, it's not. It's not a great. It's not a great part in that way either. It just seems like stuff happens to her, and she managed to get her managed to get herself out of some situations. Um, but it's it's not easy, and I think that I think that was what. For me, the the whole theme, I think, is just how difficult adulthood uh, can be and that those transition years um, yeah. of high school when you think you're kind of adult, but you're actually not. 
uh, you're dealing with some pretty adult problems and uh, you know you don't have uh, the same amount of uh, skill at navigating through them um, so for me that was a, a, a strong uh, theme in the film for sure now, so it probably looks kind of quite different when you get to our age, when you realise that despite having many, many years of trying to be an adult, I still haven't quite made it. Yeah. <laughs> it's not <laughs> going to get much better. as well sorted out as I was then. <laughs> no, and I was, you know, I was about that age. I mean, I was definitely in high school when this came out. So I, I, for me, I have that kind of nostalgia, like this was a you know a classic high school film when I was in high school. So it must have been great and it must have been meaningful. Um, so when I go back and see it, increasingly as I get older and older, it's um, the film gets worse somehow for me um <laughs> surprise surprise uh, but do you do you recognize anything of your own life in in fast times at reach mount high um or in the lives of my friends too yeah i think it you know pieces together that way like i didn't have all those experiences but i knew people who fit into that so this this film kind of depends on archetypes quite a bit because um, you know, we've got the cool dudes, the geeks, the stoners, the hot girls, the fast food workers. I mean, it's sort of all, they're all there. So I, I think okay. it kind of, everyone can touch stone to something somehow, I guess, because there are so many archetypes in there, but it doesn't mean that it's, you know, tells one coherent story very well. I don't think it's designed to, it's kind of a multi-protagonist, um, yeah. piece. Um, and when we originally paired these films, uh, my wife said, oh, that's terrible. Fast times and licorice pizza, that's not going to work. And actually, they work brilliantly, I think. And even <laughs> I had doubts too. But you know, Sean Penn's in both of them. Those yeah. that, that restaurant's almost the same restaurant as in the the licorice pizza where they're sitting in the big chairs. Yeah. Um, so much of it just hits again and again, um, where we're just getting the the same sort of feel. So I think that Paul Thomas Anderson, who wrote and directed his film, um, definitely saw this. He's about my age too, so I mean, he's you know that same. This is what he remembers in high school or in middle school. Um, so I, I think a lot of it is intentionally taken from uh, um, Fast Time. So the, these two films actually work really well together um, on a lot of levels. Um, I, I think it's interesting hearing that you can identify, if not your own life, then your friends' lives yeah. in in some of these characters. Because from the, you know from the point of view of a you know a bit of a nerdy kid growing up in the East Midlands in the UK mm. in the seventies and eighties, uh, the, the I would often go to the movies and I would see this cinematic California yeah. on screen. Yeah. And uh, you now to me, it seemed, I, I, it seemed as alien as, um, you know, the planets in star Wars that I, I felt, I, I felt more likely probably to visit um, Tatooine <laughs> than I did to, to, to mix with these kind of high school kids in California yeah. somehow that, uh, like the, all these, uh, so many movies where these kids had, had their cars and they would drive to school and the school had a big car park where all the kids turned up and, and, you know, and, and drove to school. And, um, you know, in, in uh, fast times, Stacy's family is kind of poor, I think, but they have a pool, which is yeah. you know, utterly unthinkable, uh, for the, the life that I grew up in that, you know, at least, um, you know, at least if I went to Tatooine, you know, there, you know, the weather is miserable and people are having a terrible time. So it was somehow a more <laughs> familiar environment than this kind of halcyon yeah. California, which um, seemed uh, utterly unattainable, you know, just com completely alien. I was I was uh, an adult before I saw the film Kez. I don't know if you've seen that, which is a Ken Loach film from uh, oh, the yeah. early 70s. Um, if you have a chance to see that, I mean, that film really accurately depicts like my school life until about the age of nine. That was just, that was okay. you know, the town that I grew up in and the school that I went to was represented by Kez and Kez belongs on a different planet to Fast Times at Ridgemount High. Yeah. Well, I think this, um, it's a very American film. Uh, Kez, Kez definitely does not strike me as an American <laughs> film. Um, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm not yeah. sure whether I'm disappointed or relieved to hear that there were people who, who, who could recognize Fast oh. Times at Ridgemount High. It makes me feel like I have an even more deprived childhood. <laughs> I think so well, people who were driving to school and having pools, yeah. they weren't even a fantasy. There were actually people who did that. Yeah, well, I mean, I grew up on the other coast in Maine, so my upbringing is probably more like yours. But I think a lot of it is that it's, um, and, you know, I will honestly say that, it's, you know, some of those memories might be false in the sense that because I'd been seeing stuff come out of Los Angeles and seeing that California thing in the John Hughes films and in all the films that it seems very familiar. So maybe some of it's familiar because I was an American teen as well, but a lot of it's familiar because I had the same cinematic language coming 
um, uh, from other films at the same time. Um, this, this is one of the things that we were talking about before we were yeah. uh, recording, just about how there's there's something about the the lifestyle and the um, the images projected in like 1970s, 1980s mm-hmm. Hollywood cinema, which uh, it became like the the the, sort of the proxy sort of dream world paradise for the world. Um, and I think this is you're so closely connected to um, America's soft power yep. during the, uh, the last part of the 20th century that Hollywood is fantastic propaganda machine. Um, but the kind of propaganda it was producing wasn't about military might um, or about you know, fast planes and you know, the daring do of the Second World War. It was this kind of propaganda about um, about economic expectation. Mm. And and um, and and this kind of mirage of prosperity. Yeah. Um, and I think the, even now, I wonder whether you know, people that I work with and know who you know, want to go and live in America, want to go and work in America. Part of that dream is fed by the 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 experience, the proxy experience they had of of California from these you know, Los Angelino films from the from the nineteen eighties. Yeah. Well, it's it's a well created illusion. It's well marketed. And it's it's around the world as soft power exactly. So that's what that's the image that's out there. That's how we a lot a lot of us think of it. And I'm sure Los Angeles, which I, it's not a city I know very well, but I'm sure it has lots of uh, less than glamorous um, aspects too as well. So, and that's the same with the entire country, of course. Um, but we continue to come back to that. You know, this idea that it is this, this paradise of sorts, and that uh, the film industry is centered there, and the film industry sort of perpetuates the our very perspective of it, I think. I wonder, I wonder whether this will persist for the next sort of 20 or 30 years. I wonder what will happen you know, as, as kind of the West soft power declines. And I wonder whether we'll get another kind of replacement halcyon paradise that will be, you know, we'll, we'll all be dreaming of going to Mumbai, won't we, in 20 years? Time. <laughs> yeah. It'll be a different world. So, um, be, yeah. okay, here's, here's my question. I got a, I got a question for you yeah. now then. So um, if I could give you a, you know, a time machine and you could travel back and be, any of the characters in either Licorice Pizza or Fast Times, uh, who, who would you travel back and become? Whose, whose shoes would you like to step into out of all these crazy characters that we've watched? Oof. Um, excellent question. Um, I, I, in Fast Times, I think there's so many awkward uh, characters surviving an awkward time of life. I don't think I could choose anyone from that <laughs> film, honestly. But returning um, to nightmares. <laughs> yeah. I think um, in Licorice Pizza, I'm a big Tom Waits fan, and I just love the fact that someone can, you know, get the attention of an entire restaurant, get people <laughs> laughing, yell at superstars across the restaurant, and then convince that superstar to go outside and put his motorcycle over a burning fire in front of all the diners who've left their hot meals to go see this guy jump on a motorcycle. <laughs> I'd have to say Tom Waits in Licorice Pizza I, would be a, that is that is the correct answer, isn't it? Oh my God, it is Tom Waits in Licorice Pizza. You're right. That is the man that we would all like to. Yeah, that we would all like to be. Did I say this earlier? When when um, I it was so good, I had to write it down. That when um, Tom Waits sees Sean Penn in the restaurant for the first time, he shouts across the restaurant at him. He says, "You shiny, tall, expensive prick!" He calls him. <laughs> I want to be able to address people like that in restaurants. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yep, those are the shoes I want to step into. Uh, how about yourself, though? Which were there any characters that you saw yourself in more than others in either film? You know, I I. The guy that I thought reminded me of me was Rat, who is the, mm-hmm. you know, the the sweet nerdy guy who fails to take advantage of Jennifer Jason Lee. Yeah, you know, I looked and and who looks so tiny in the big chair at the restaurant. I, um, <laughs> yeah. that, that was the guy that I identified with, and I wonder whether uh, you know that's the guy that the whole audience is supposed to identify with. He is the, he's the character that Jennifer Jason Lee ends up with in the end. Yeah, so you know the, the film is um, is you know casting him as the good guy. Yeah. He is the guy that we should admire and want to be like. Um, yeah. So I don't know whether it's the film's success or whether it's my, you know, my personal social failure. But he was the guy that I felt closest to. Good, good answer. Um, He's definitely the and, best and guy. I, I did read this is this is my fast times at Ridgemont High trivia that yeah. apparently the real guy that the character of Rat is based on is the same guy who founded the uh, the For Dummies books. Apparently so. So he uh, he. Uh, wrote and then published the first four dummies books. Right, so yeah, oh. maybe that's maybe, maybe that's the mantle I would like to inherit. I, there's worse, yeah. there's 
worse ways to be remembered by history than the guy who came up with the for dummies books yeah well so um you know such an empathetic personality i think both as a character and probably as a human um in times that are so selfish and avaricious you know that's like in the 80s we think of uh just American greed to a certain extent. So I think uh, he is the one character I'm not surprised that you would attach to because, yeah, I think he was the one to root for. Uh, he's incredibly and probably unwisely capable of, uh, of forgiveness, right? He actually forgives uh, Mike at the very end, shakes his hand, yeah. doesn't really doesn't really want to beat him up in that uh, locker room scene um, and probably can't and doesn't. And uh, he, well, also just as an aside, he's a film buff. He's taking tickets at the theater and... Uh, you too, Jimmy, are a film buffer. Uh, you're right. Yep, so you yep. That guy was written for us, wasn't he? Yeah. That guy really was written for us. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that was that was so that was that was our, our trip to California. Yeah. Um uh that was good fun. I'm not I'm not sure that I would race to watch Fast Times at Ridgemount High again. No. But I think I probably would watch Licorice Pizza when it comes around onto streaming again. Um it was a lot to enjoy there. I I uh, I would look forward to seeing that again, actually. I think there's richness and pleasure to be taken from that on a second viewing. Yeah, I'm sure at, at some point in my life I will have a second view of it as well. Right. Uh, so uh, that was a lot of fun. It was uh, a lot of fun. This has I, been... Yeah, I should say, I was just going to say, I'll have a second view at uh, Los Angeles as well. I'm going there. So next uh, next uh, pod, maybe I can talk about my in-person uh, experiences yeah. in Los Angeles because my yeah. first time through feedback. was not pleasant. Tell, tell yeah. us if you meet Phoebe Cates. <laughs> yeah. um, excellent. So, uh, okay, feedback on the next pod. Yeah. Um, this has been Two Real Cinema Club. This has been a lot of fun, and we will see you for the next one. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye.